Did you know that the song Suffer Little Children, that was written by Morrissey and Johnny Marr, was based on the Moore murders? Hey everybody, what's up and welcome back. If you're new here, I'm Liz, and today we're going to talk about the Moore murders at the hands of Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. Now, these were tragic, tragic murders that happened in England. Now, the song written and performed by the Smiths, Suffer Little Children, is about this. Now, basically, background on the story is that the Moore murders took place in Saddlesworth Moor, which overlooks Manchester in England, and the, the murders happened between 63 and 1956. And at the times of the murders, the victims were very young. And they were older than Morrissey at the time. So Morrissey was born in 1959. And a few of these kids were very, very young. So, and he's the one that wrote lyrics of the song after he read a book about the murders. And the book is called Beyond Belief, A Chronicle of Murder and Its Deception by Emlyn Williams. So this was the first song that he wrote with Johnny Marr. And the title of the song is a phrase found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, verse 14, in which Jesus rebukes his disciples and turns away children and says, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for, for of such is a kingdom of heaven. Like I said, these murders were carried out by Ian Brady and Myra Henley. Um, Their victims were five children. They were Pauline Reed, John Kilbride, Keith Bennett, Leslie Ann Downey and Edward Evans. They were all aged between 10 and 17, and at least four of them were sexually assaulted. Uh, their bodies were discovered, well, the bodies of two of them were discovered in 1965, and this is when uh, the graves were dug in Saddlesworth Moor. The third grave was discovered in 1987, uh, more than 20 years after the trial of Brady and Hindley. Um, and Bennett's body is also thought to be buried there, but despite any searches, it still remains undiscovered. So let's get into who they are. So Ian Brady was born in Glasgow, Scotland as Ian Duncan Stewart, and he was born on the 2nd of January of 1938 to Peggy Stewart, who was an unmarried tea room waitress. So the identity of his father was never really known. Um, his mother said that he was a reporter working for the Glasgow newspaper, but died three months prior to him being born. Uh, Stuart had little support, and after a few months, she was forced to give her son to the care of Mary and John Sloan, which was a local couple with four children of their own. Um, Brady then took their name and became known as Ian Sloan. Um, his mother continued to visit him throughout his childhood, and there was various authors that stated that he tortured chil uh, tortured children. I mean, he did, but tortured animals during his childhood, and even though Ian objected to these accusations. Um, at the age of nine, he ended up visiting Loch Lomond um, with his family. So Loch, or Loch Lomond, or Loch Lomond? Um, this is... Called, it's the Lake of Elms, basically, and it's a very long lake said to be where Loch Ness Monster is. Hence my Loch, Loch Um But yeah, he went there with his family, and it's when he discovered that he loved the outdoors. After a few months, um, the family moved to a new council home in the Overspill Estate. Of Pollock. Um, Brady then was accepted to the Shawlands Academy and this is for a school that the kids are like bright. They're above average students. So his behavior ended up worsening while he was there. As a teenager he appeared twice in juvenile court for breaking into homes um, and then he left the academy at the age of 15 to take a job as a tea boy at Harlan and Wolf Shipyard in Govan. About nine months later, he started working as a butcher's messenger boy, and he had a, he would end up having a girlfriend. Her name is Evelyn Grant. Um, their and their relationship ended when he threatened her with a flick knife, and um, she visited a dance with another boy. 
So this is why he threatened her. Um, he again appeared in court, this time with nine charges against him, and shortly before his 17th birthday, he was placed on probation. Um, <laughs> and this was on the condition that he lived with his mother. And by this time, Brady's mom had moved to Manchester and married an Irish fruit merchant named Patrick Brady. Um, Patrick got Ian a job as a fruit porter at the market in Smithfield, and this is when Ian took the last name Brady. So within a year of moving, um, Ian was caught with a sack of lead seals in, that he stole when he was trying to smuggle them out of the market. Um, he was instant to strange ways for three months. As he was still under the age of 18, this is, he was sentenced to two years in a borstal for training, um, and he was sent to the Latchmer House in London. And then Hatfield Borstal in West Riding of Yorkshire. So, um, after he was discovered being drunk, of which he had brewed, um, he was moved to a much tougher unit in Hull. He was released on the 14th of November of 1957, and Brady then returned to Manchester where he took a laboring job, of which he hated, um, and he, dismiss he was dismissed from another job in a brewery. Um, he decided that he needed to better himself, so he obtained a set of instruction manuals and bookkeeping at a local like public library to which he was astonished his parents let him study alone in his room for hours um, so in 1959 in January he applied and was offered a clerical job at the Millwards um, which is a wholesale chemical distributing company based in Corton and his colleagues said that he was quiet punctual and short-tempered um, he read books including Teach Yourself German and Mein Kampf, as well as works of Nazi atrocities. Um, he rode a Tiger Cub motorcycle, which he used to visit the um, Pennines, Myra. Let's get into Myra. Uh, she was born in Crumpsale and on the 23rd of July of 1942 to Nellie and Bob Henley. She was raised in Gorton and then, I mean, she was from a working class family. And they lived in that area of Manchester that was dominated by slum housing. Her father was an alcoholic who frequently was violent towards her mother and the children. Um, the family was in such a poor condition that Myra was forced to sleep in a single bed next to her parents' double bed. And their living situation deteriorated even more when Myra's sister Maureen was born in August of 1946. And the following year... This is when Myra was sent to live with her grandmother. So Myra's parents had served in the parachute regiment and was stationed in North Africa, um, Cyprus, and in Italy during World War II. Um, her father had was known to be a hard-working man while in the army, and he expected his daughter to be equally as tough. So he taught her how to fight and insisted that she stick up for herself. So when Myra was about eight, a local boy scratched her cheeks and drew blood. She burst into tears and then she ran to her dad and who threatened to leather her if she didn't go after him. So Myra found the boy and knocked him down a series of punches. Um, she later wrote that eight years old, I'd scored my first victory. Um, Malcolm McCulloch, um, a professor at forensic psychiat psychiatry at Cardiff University, wrote that Myra's relationship with her father um, brutalized her. And she was not only used for violence in the home, but she was rewarded for it as she used it outside. Um, and when this happens at a young age, it can distort your reactions to your parents in different situations of your life. So in June of 1957, one of her closest friends, a 13 year old, Michael Higgins, invited Myra to go to uh, like swimming with friends at a local re reservoir. But she instead went elsewhere with another friend. So apparently Michael drowned at the reservoir and Myra, who was a good swimmer, was deeply upset because she wasn't there. <laughs> she blamed herself for his death. Um, she took up a collection for a wreath for his funeral that was held at St. Francis's Monastery in Gordon Lane. Uh, this is where Myra was baptized as a Catholic in 1942. And this, her religion really stuck with her. Um, Myra's father insisted that she be baptized Catholic and her mother agreed only so that she could be sent to a Catholic school. And her mother believed that all monks are taught, uh, all monks taught the, um, catechism. Myra was very drawn to Roman Catholic Church, 
um, after she started at the Ryder Brow Secondary Modern, and she began taking a formal, like, reception to the church after her friend's death, and she took the confirmation, confirmation name of Veronica, so her name was Myra Veronica Henley, and she received her first communion in 1958. So Myra's first job was that of a junior clerk at an electrical engineering firm. She ran errands, she typed, she made tea, and she was well-liked. Um, she was well-liked enough to that when she lost her first week's like wage packet, the girls took up a collection to replace it. So at the age of 17, she became engaged after a short courtship, but this was called off several months later after deciding that he was too immature and was unable to provide her the life that she wanted. Uh, Myra then took weekly jo uh, judo lessons at a local school and was her partners were reluctant to train her, but as she was often slow to release her grip, um, so it was hard for them to teach her. She then took a job at Bratby and Hinchlift, which is an engineering company in Gorton, but was dismissed because of her attendance after about six months. So, in 1961, this is when Myra joins Millwards as a typist. She soon meets Ian, and she becomes infatuated. She's 18 at the time. So, and she stays infatuated with him, even with knowing he has a criminal record. Uh, Myra began a diary, and although she dated other men, some of her entries detail her fascination with Ian, uh, to whom she spoke for the first time on the 27th of July. So it literally took from January to July for her to talk to him. So over the next few months, she continued to make entries. And she was like increasingly infatuated with him. So on the 22nd of December, this is when Ian asked her to go out on a date to the movie. To the movies. Um, and they state that the film that they saw was The Judgment at Nuremberg. Um, but Myra called it The King of Kings. So their date followed a regular pattern, a trip to the cinema. They usually walked, watched an X-rated film. And then they went back to Myra's house to drink wine, specifically German wine. Um, Ian then gave her reading material, and the pair spent their working lunches reading aloud to one another of Nazi atrocities. Um, Myra began to emulate the Aryan perfection. Uh, she bleached her hair white and applied th like thick crimson lipstick. She expressed concern of some aspects of Ian's character, uh, specifically in a letter to a childhood friend, and she mentioned that there was an incident where she was drugged by Ian, um, but also wrote of her obsession of her of him. A few months later, she asked her friend to destroy the letter, and in her 30,000 word plea for parole in 1978 and 1979, this was submitted to the Home Secretary, Merlin Reese. Myra states that within months, Ian had convinced her that there was no god and he could have told me that the earth was flat the moon was made of green cheese and the sun rose in the west and i would have believed him because he had a power of persuasion myra began to change her appearance she wore clothes um, that was considered risque such as high boots short skirts leather jackets and they became less sociable to their colleagues uh, the couple then regu like were regulars at the library they borrowed books on philosophy as well as crime and torture um, they also read works by the Marquis de Sade, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Fyodor Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, which I have that book and it's really good. Um, although Myra was not a qualified driver, she passed her test but she after she failed three times. Um, and this was in 1963. She often hired a van in which the couple planned bank robberies. Um, so Myra ended up befriending... befriending befriending a man named George Clitheroe, who was the president of the Cheadle Rifle Club. And on several occasions, they visited the shooting ranges together. So, although George was puzzled by her interest, he arranged for her to buy a 22 rifle um, from a gun merchant in Manchester. She also asked to join the pistol club, but she was a poor shot. And she, allegedly, she had a bad temper. So George told her that she was unsuitable and she did not, um, she did though manage to purchase a Webley 45 and a Smith and Wesson 38, um, from other members of the club. So Ian and Myra planned, like, on different robberies, but nothing came of it and they became interested in photography instead. So Brady already owned a box brownie, which he used to take photos of Myra and her dog, Puppet. Um, but he upgraded to a more sophisticated model. 
and purchase lights and dark room equipment. So the pair took photos of each other and for that time would have been considered explicit. So Myra, this demonstrated the fact that it marked a change from her earlier, more shy and prudish nature rather than a very um, outlandish behavior now. So Myra claimed that Ian began talking to her about committing the perfect murder in June, of June of 63, uh, July of 1963, sorry, and often spoke to her about Meyer Levin's compulsion, which was published as a novel in 1956 and adapted for the movies in 1959. So the fictionalized account is that of Leopold and Loeb, um, which is a case of two young men from well-to-do families who attempt to commit the perfect murder of a 12-year-old boy who escaped the death penalty because of their age. Now, by June of 1963, Brady moves in with Myra at her grandmother's house at Bannock Street. And on the 12th of July, they murdered their first victim, which is Pauline Reed. And she attended the school with Myra's younger sister, Maureen and had also been in a short relationship with David Smith, who was a local boy um, with three criminal convictions for minor cases. So when they investigated the disappearance of Pauline, they discovered that, well, basically they found that they nobody had seen Pauline before her disappearance. Although her boyfriend, David Smith, was questioned by police, he was cleared of any involvement in her death. So the next victim is John Kilbride, and he was killed on the 23rd of November. So a huge search was um, undertaken um, with about 700 statements taken. And there's about 500 missing persons posters printed as well. Eight days after he failed to come home. There was 2,000 volunteers that scoured waste grounds and derelict buildings. Um, Myra hired a vehicle a week after... John's uh, John Kilbride went missing, and on the 21st of December, apparently made sure that the burial sites at Saddle Saddleworth Moor weren't disturbed. So, in February of 1964, she bought a secondhand Austin Traveler, but soon after traded it for a minivan. So, uh, Keith Bennett disappeared on the 16th of June of 1964. Um, his stepfather, Jimmy Johnson, was a suspect. But in the two years following his disappearance, Johnson was taken in for questioning on four different occasions, and detectives searched under the floorboards of the house and discovered that the houses, like the houses in a row, were connected and extended the search uh, to the entire street. So Myra's sister Maureen ended up marrying David Smith, which was the boyfriend of Pauline Reed, um, on the fifteenth of August of nineteen sixty-four. Their marriage was very much arranged and performed at the registrar's office. So none of Maureen's relatives attended. Myra didn't approve of the marriage and her mother was too embarrassed as Maureen was seven months pregnant when they got married. Um, the newlyweds moved to his father's house and the next day this is when Ian suggested that they take a four-day trip to Windermere. Um, this was the first time that Ian and David met properly and David was impressed by um, Ian was impressed by David's demeanor. Um, they talked about society, distribution of wealth, and po the possibility of robbing a bank. Such a great thing to talk about with your brother-in-law, huh? Um, so the trip to the Lake District was the first of many outings and Myra was apparently jealous of their friendship and became closer to her sister because of it. So in 1964, Myra, um, Myra's grandmother and her and Ian were rehoused as a part of a post-war slum clearance in Manchester. And they ended up moving to a, in a state in Hattersley, which is in Cheshire. So Ian and Myra became friendly with Patricia Hodges, who was an 11-year-old girl who lived at 12 Wardo Brook Avenue. Um, Hodges was accompanied accompanied the two on the trips to Saddlesworth Moor to collect peat, and something that many householders on the new estate did approve, like did to improve their soil and their gardens, um, which were full of clay and builder's rubble. So the couple never harmed her since she lived only a few, do few doors away, which made it easier for the police to solve any disappearance. 
Um, so early on Boxing Day in 1964, Myra left her grandmother at a relative's house and refused to allow her back to their home that night. And on the same day, this is when Leslie Ann Downey disappeared um, from a fun fair in Ann Coates. Despite a huge search, she was not found. So the following day, this is when Myra brought her grandmother back home. And by February of 1965, Hodges had stopped visiting Wardle Brook Avenue, but David was a regular visitor. Brady gave David books to read and the two discussed robbery and murder and on Myra's 23rd birthday her sister and her brother-in-law who until then had been living with relatives were rehoused in under underwood court which is not far from where Myra and Ian lived the two couples began seeing each other regularly and usually only on Ian's terms so during the 90s Myra claimed that she took part in the killings only because Ian drugged her and was blackmailing her with pornographic pictures that he took of her and threatened to kill Maureen. Myra's solicitor, his name is Andrew McCooey, reported that she told him, I ought to have been hanged. I deserved it. My crime was worse than Ian's because I enticed the children and they never would have entered the car without my role. I have always regarded myself worse than Ian. Sometimes the women are just worse in these scenarios. No offense, sometimes the women are worse. So kind of go into to the murders. So Pauline Reed is our first victim. That was on the 12th of July of 1963. So on this day, this is when Ian tells Myra he wants to commit the perfect murder. So he instructs her to drive a barred van around while he followed on a bicycle. And he spot him when he would likely spot a victim, he would flash his headlight. So when they were driving down Gorton Lane, this is when he saw a young girl and he signaled for Myra, who did not stop because she recognized the girl as an eight-year-old neighbor of her mother's. So sometime after 7.30 on Froxmer Street, this is when Ian signals Myra to stop for 16-year-old Paula Reed, or Pauline Reed, um, who is the schoolmate of Maureen, Myra's sister. She's on her way to a dance. Um, Myra offers Reed a lift, and at various times, this is when Myra gave conflicting statements about the extent to which she versus Ian were responsible for selecting Pauline as their first victim, but she felt there would be less attention given to the disappearance of a teenager rather than an eight-year-old. So once in the van, this is when Myra asked her to help um, search in Saddlesworth more for an expensive lost glove. Pauline agreed and they drove there. So when Ian arrived on his motorcycle, Myra, tell, Myra tells Pauline he would be helping in the search but Myra later claimed that she waited in the van while Ian took Pauline onto the moor, and Ian returned alone about 30 minutes later. And this is when he took her back to the spot where Pauline was lying dead. Her clothes were in disarray, and she had nearly been decapitated uh, by two cuts to the throat, which included a four-inch incision across her voice box, inflicted with such force, um, and into which the color of her throat, the color of her coat, um, and a throat chain had been pushed. So when Meyer asked Ian if he raped Pauline, he said, of course I did. Uh, Myra stayed with Pauline while Ian retrieved a, a shovel um, that he had hidden nearby on a previous visit. And in Brady's account, this is when Myra was not only present for the attack, but also participated in the sexual assault. So, in the evening of the 23rd of November of 1963, at the market of the Ashton under Lyne, this is when they offered John Kilbride a lift home, um, and saying that his parents might worry that he's out so late. So they promised him a bottle of sherry. Uh, once John was inside of Henley's Ford Anglia car that she hired, um, they said that they would detour, make a detour on their way home. So en route, he suggested another detour, uh, this time to search for a glove that Myra lost at the moor. Um, when they reached the moor, Myra took John with him. No, Ian took John with him while Myra waited in the car. He then sexually assaulted John and then slit his throat with a six-inch serrated blade before strangling him with a shoelace or a string. Our next is Keith Bennett. So Keith Bennett was 12 years old at the time of his murder, and on the early evening of the 16th of June of 1964, um, he was on his way to his grandmother's house in Long Sight. Um, and Myra asked him 
to help load some boxes into her mini pickup after which she would drive him home. So of course Ian was in the back of the van. Myra drove to a lay-by on the Saddlesworth Moor and Ian went off with Keith looking for a lost glove. The same lost glove. After about 30 minutes this is when he returned alone he, and he was carrying a shovel that he had hidden earlier and in response to Myra's questions he said that he sexually assaulted him and strangled him with a piece of string. Leslie Ann Downey is our next victim um, who was taken from the Fun Fair and Coats on the 26th of December of 1964. Um, in this, so they noticed that she was alone and Leslie Ann Downey was 10 at the time. So they approached her and they deliberately dropped something they were carrying. Then they asked for help in taking the packages to their car. This is when um, they went to Wardle Brook Avenue. And at the house, um, they made Leslie undress. They gagged her and forcibly posed her in photographs before killing her and raping her. Well, raping her and killing her. Um, and she was found dead. Uh, so basically what happened is Myra later like maintained that she went to fill bath for Leslie and Downey, but found her dead when she returned. Ian claimed that Myra killed Downey. And the following morning, this is when Ian and Myra drove Leslie's body to the moor and buried her naked with her clothes at her feet in a shallow grave. Um, Edward Evans is our next victim. And on the evening of the 6th of October of 1965, this is when Myra drove Ian to Manchester Central Railway Station, where she waited outside in the car whilst he selected their victim. After a few minutes, this is when Ian reappeared in the company of a 17-year-old boy named Edward Evans. And he was an apprentice engineer at Ardwick, um, to whom he introduced Myra as his sister. Ian later claimed that he picked up Edward as like hopes of a sexual encounter. Um, and then they drove to Myra and Ian's house on Wardlebrook Ave, where they relaxed over a bottle of wine. Um, at some point, Ian sent Myra to go get David, her brother-in-law, and Myra's family didn't approve of Maureen's marriage to David, who had several criminal convictions, which we've already kind of talked about, which included bodily harm and housebreaking. Um, so, because of the previous years of Ian cultivating a friendship with David, he thought that David would want to be a part of it. But she, like, they were increasingly worried that, and Myra was very, like, worried about their safety. So Myra returned with David and told him to wait outside for a signal with a flashing light. When the signal came, David knocked on the door and was met by Ian. Um, who asked if he wanted to come in for menstrual bottles of wine, left him in the kitchen saying that he was going to collect the wine. And David later told police that he waited about a minute or two and then suddenly I heard a hell of a scream. It sounded like a woman, really high pitched, and then the scream carried on one after another. Then I heard Myra, Dave, help him. Um, this is when he ran in and just stood in the living room and saw a young boy who was laying with his head and shoulders on the couch and his legs on the floor. He was facing upwards. Ian was standing over him, facing him with his legs on either side of the young lad's legs. And he was facing upwards. Ian was standing over him, facing him. Um, the lad was screaming, and Ian had a hatchet in his hand, and he was holding it above his head, and he hit him on the left side of the head with a hatchet. He heard the blow. It was a terrible hard blow, and it sounded horrible. David then watched Ian strangle him with an electrical cord. Ian sprained his ankles in the struggle, and Edward's body was too heavy for him to carry the car on his own, so they wrapped him in plastic sheeting and put him in a spare bedroom. David agreed to return the following morning with his, his baby's um, stroller for use in transporting Edward's body to the car before disposing of it. So he arrived home around 3 a.m., um, and asked his wife to make him a cup of tea, which he drank and then vomited, um, and then told her what he witnessed. At about 6.10 a.m., he waited for daylight to and armed himself with a screwdriver and a bread knife, telling her, like, I'll be back. And this is in case Ian was planning to, like, deceive him, too. 
So David then called the police from a telephone booth on the estate. So like, it's not really a permanent thing now, but pay phones, if you don't, if you know what a pay phone is, then you'll know what a telephone booth is or a phone box. So he went to a pay phone and he called the cops. Um, he was picked up by a police car from the pay phone and taken to Hyde Police Station where he told the officers what he witnessed. Um, so the superintendent of the Staley Bridge Police went to the home on Wordlebrook Ave and he was also accompanied by a detective by a detective sergeant. So he was wearing a bread man's delivery like overall uniform and then um, basically asked Myra at the back door if her husband was home and when she denied that she had a husband or that there was a man in the house. This is when he had identified himself and Myra led him into the living room. This is where Ian was lying on a dive in and he was writing to his employer about his ankles injury. Um, but Talbot then explained that he was investigating an act of violence involving guns and that was reported to have taken the previous evening. This is when Myra denied that there was any violence and allowed the police to look around the house and when the police asked for the key to the locked spare bedroom she said it was at her workplace but offered police after police offered to take her to retrieve it Brady told her to hand it over. Um, this is when police returned to the living room and asked well, told Brady that he was arrested on suspicion of murder, and as he was getting dressed, he said, Eddie and I had a row, and the situation got out of hand. So, though Myra wasn't initially arrested, she demanded that she go with Ian to the police station, and she took her dog, too. She refused to make any statement on Edward's death, beyond claiming it was an accident, and she was allowed to go home on condition that she returned the next day. So over the next four days, she visited her employer and asked to be dismissed so that she would be eligible for unemployment benefits. Um, on one of these occasions, she found an envelope belonging to Ian, which she burned in an ashtray. She claimed she didn't open it, um, but she did believe it was a plan for bank robberies. So on the 11th of October, she was, she was arrested as well and taken into custody and being charged as an accessory to murder of Edward Evans and remanded at the HM prison in Risley. So... Basically, basically, what happened is after they're arrested, this is when they find everything. They find photographs of the children. They end up talking to Myra and Ian about the different children that have gone missing. And when they searched the house, this is when they found an exercise book with the name John Kilbride on it, which is one of their victims, which they made them suspect Ian and Myra was involved in the disappearance of the other youngsters as well. So there was also pornographic photos that they found of Leslie Ann Downey and a six minute audio recording of a girl identifying herself as Leslie Ann Weston, which ended up being Leslie Ann Downey. And in this recording, she's crying, screaming, and pleading to be allowed to return home to her mom. Um, Downey's mom later confirmed that that was her daughter. I feel bad that she had to listen to that. During several inquiries of the neighboring homes, they also spoke to Patricia Hodges, which is the girl that frequented their house that they refused to take. She pointed out that their favorite site was along the A635 road, which was the Moors. Um, and they began to search the area immediately. And what they found is they ended up finding an arm bone that was protruding through the peat, which they thought to be Kilbrides. But it was eventually identified that of Leslie and Downey's body, whose body was still visually identifiable, um, and her mother was able to identify the clothing that was also buried at her feet. So along with photographs that they found in a suitcase were a number of scenes of, like, at the Morse. Um, Smith told, so David told police that Ian boasted of photographic proof of the multiple murders that he committed basically just like gave them a home run of what had happened 21st of october they found the body of kilbride which had been identified by his clothing and that same day they were already being held for the murders of evans of edward evans so myra and ian appeared at the magistrate's court and they were charged with leslie and downey's murder as well as they further went on they found more of the bodies and they ended up, basically what happened is they ended up 
adding to their try adding to their convictions and stuff like that. So their 14 day trial started on the 19th of April of 1966, and this is the courtroom is filled with security screens to protect Ian and Myra, who were charged with murdering Edward Evans, Leslie and Downey, and Kilbride. I'm not going to go too further into this, other than the fact that they entered pleas of not guilty, and Ian testified over a course of eight hours, and Myra, it took six hours to testify. They went into detail of what, what they did with all of these children. Ian admitted to hitting Edward Evans with an axe, and that but claimed that somebody else had killed him, apparently. They listened to the six, 16 minute tape of Leslie Ann Downey, on which the voices of Myra and Ian were completely audible and it was played in open court. Her attitude towards Leslie Ann Downey was very brutal and cruel, but claimed to only have done that because she was afraid that somebody might have heard her. Myra also claimed that Leslie Ann Downey was being undressed by herself while she was downstairs when the pornographic photos were taken and that it was just Ian because at this time this is when she was drawing a bath for her. So on May 6th after deliberating for a little over two hours this is when they found Ian guilty of all three murders and Myra guilty of just the murders of Leslie and Downey and Edward Evans. The death penalty had been abolished while they were held on remand and the judge gave them sentences of life imprisonment. Brady was sentenced to three concurrent life sentences and Myra was given two, uh, plus a concurrent seven-year term for harboring Brady and the knowledge that he had for killing Kilbride. So they also think that there is a possibility they're connected to other missing children and teenagers. Um, one of them is Stephen Jennings. He was a three-year-old from West Yorkshire who was last seen alive in December of 1962. Um, his body was found in 1988 buried in a field. And the following year, his father ended up being found guilty of his murder, though. Jennifer Tigg, um, she's a 14-year-old girl who disappeared in the Oldham Children's Home from an Oldham Children's Home in 1964, um, was mentioned in the press f like some 40 years later, but they was confirmed by the police to be alive. Um, this followed claims in 2004 that Myra had told another inmate that she and Brady had murdered his sixth victim, which was a teenage girl. So Myra ended up helping the police search them more in 1986. Uh, police ended up closing the roads to the moor, which was patrolled by 200 officers. Some of them were armed, some of them weren't. Myra and her solicitor left Cookham Wood at 4.30 a.m. and flew to the moor, and then they were driven and walked around until about 3. Myra had a difficulty connecting to what she saw in her memories and apparently was very nervous when the helicopters were flying overhead. The press described this visit as a fiasco in a publicity stunt and mindless waste of money because nothing came of this of one of these visits and there's two visits that she helped assist the police in 1987 there were news that Myra ended up confession like made a confession uh, became public and that it was all over the news um, she in the writing that continued her detention like to satisfy a mob emotion was not right so basically, she had to make a public statement, which she touched on her reason of denying her guilt previously and her religious experiences in prison, and a letter from different people like that helped her. And she saw no possibility of release and also exonerated David Smith from any part of the murders other than that of Edward Evans. Um, so over the next few months in, like, in the search of the Moors, it kind of like lessened. Um, this is when they found Reed's body, and this was after more than a hundred days. Um, and he was just below the surface, and it was about a hundred yards from where Leslie and Downey's body's body was found. Um, Ian had been cooperating with the police for some time, and when the news of the body uh, reached him, he made a formal confession in a statement too to the press that he would help the police in their search. He was taken to the moor on the 3rd of July, seemed to really like lose his bearings and he like the call the, the search was called off around 3 p.m. that day. Also at this time there was a large group of press and television that gathered on the moor to just see him. So they refused to allow him to visit the moor a second time and the police search was called off by the 24th of August. But he eventually was taken a second time in December, claimed to have located his, 
been its burial site, but his body has never been found. Ian basically was just digging him around the whole time. Just digging him around. So, Ian, Ian ended up dying in 2017. He, after he received end-of-life care, he, he died from restrictive pulmonary disease at Ashworth Hospital. Um, this was on the 15th of May of 2017. An inquest into his death found that he died of natural causes and that his hunger strike had not been a contributing factor. He was in a hunger strike basically since 20, 2012, like on and off hunger strike. Um, he was cremated without a ceremony and his ashes were disposed at the sea during the night. Um, so Myra, was she tried to appeal her conviction Immediately after her trial, she corresponded to Ian by letters in 1971, and she ended her relationship with him. Uh, they remained in sporadic contact for several months, but Myra had fallen in love with one of her prison warders. Her name is Patricia Cairns. So apparently she found love after lockup. And apparently Patricia tried to um, break her out of prison too, but this didn't work, and Patricia was sentenced to six years, six years in jail. Um... Myra ended up spend t was told that she should spend 25 years in prison before being considered for parole. I mean, I I would say more or just without parole for what she did. It sounds really bad, but this ca ugh, this case really like. So Myra ended up did passing away on the 15th of November of 2002, and Myra ended up dying from bronchial pneumonia while she was in prison. So both of them have passed away. We're not going to get anything else from them, basically. But ba So, long story short, the Saddleworth Moors are forever dubbed by the Moor murders, and basically its good reputation was destroyed by two sadistic killers like that were very depraved and felt that they needed, they needed to do something. So my feels is that I don't whatever Myra was trying to spill, like with her saying that Ian was the one that basically like convinced her that she needed to do this. No, I think that's horseshit. I think that Myra did this on her own accord with the help of him. I think that she was very much involved in every crime that they committed together with all of their victims, with all five, possibly six if there was six. I do believe that she was just as guilty as him and that she should have received three life sentences like he did. Like I said, the Smiths had the song Suffer Little Children. That was off of their 1984 album. Um, this case has been covered multiple different times. Um, it was dramatized on TV twice. Uh, one was See No Evil, The More Murders, and then the other one was called Longford. Um, both of them came out in 2006. Then they also did a documentary in 2020 where they talked about Rose West and Myra Henley, um, which is their untold story with Trevor McDonald. So Rosemary West is another serial killer. I don't know if I'll cover her. I don't know if I can handle covering her and her husband. Um, and they grew close in jail and they bonded over similar crimes. And then they had an affair, um, which was cool. And then they became rivals to become prison royalty. A lot of people assume that this is where, um, oh, what is it called? There's a British drama. It's not Orange is the New Black. It's, it starts with a, I think it's called, it starts with a W, something worth. But if you know what it is, put it in the comments down below. I know exactly like what I'm talking about, but I can't spit it out. And a lot of people think that this is what inspired that show. So that, my friends, is the gruesome crimes of the Moore murders at the hands of Ian Brady and Meyer Henley. So, yes. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe if you're new, turn your notification bell on to all, and I'll see you guys tomorrow in a brand new video. Bye, guys.